So British coronations and the Lord's anointed. That is the structure of my part of this uh, lecture. So I want to begin by talking about anointing in general. A ritual of anointing exists in several religions, uh, but the key point for our purposes is that in the Western Christian tradition, its roots lie in the Old Testament of the Bible. The first book of Samuel relates that the elders had asked the prophet to choose a king to function as both judge and war leader. Samuel selected Saul. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? Later in the same book, Samuel chooses Saul's successor, and this passage clarifies the effect of the anointing. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Still more influential was this text in the first book of Kings, which explains what happened when David decided to hand over to his son Solomon. David ordered Solomon to be taken to Gihon and let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet there anoint him king over Israel, then blow the trumpet and say, long live King Solomon. Two further passages confirm that they did exactly that. There are references to anointing in the New Testament. For example, Acts 4.27 has the friends of the apostles Peter and John acknowledge that Jesus has been anointed by God. In a New Testament sense, anointing is an external act signifying an inner descent of the Holy Spirit upon the recipient. Taken together, therefore, various parts of the Bible cement the idea that for the ruler, this is the supremely sacred moment of rebirth. Obviously, in that context, a special liquid had to be used. At first, it was chrism, which is consecrated olive oil mixed with balsam. That compound was not exclusive to coronations, though, for chrism was also employed in the sacrament of baptism. However, the royal entitlement to unction with chrism was gradually withheld in Western Christendom, except in France, because Roman Catholic theologians in the Middle Ages argued that the substance was a purely ecclesiastical institution, use should be restricted to the ordination of priests and the consecration of bishops. Consequently, olive oil without the addition of balsam, and this simple version was known as the oil of the catechumens, became the norm. Yet, perplexingly, England reverted to earlier practice. When the change occurred is unknown, but it is found in the fourth recension of the coronation rite, which means that it was probably adopted for Edward II's coronation in 1308. The rubrics of the fourth recension prescribe that after unction with the oil of the catechumens, the king must be anointed with chrism on the head in the form of a cross. The number of places to be anointed has fluctuated over the centuries. Now I want to turn to um, part two of the structure, the holy oil of St. Thomas of Canterbury. Now one curious aspect of English or British coronations is the limited degree to which they gave rise to a mythology. There was, however, one myth which did eventually become mixed up with a series of medieval coronations and is of considerable interest for what it tells us about the royal aspirations to a special religious status above and beyond that accorded by the anointing itself. In order to understand the myth, we must make a brief detour to France. Traditionally, it will be recalled, French kings were crowned at Reims. Of incredible longevity, a legend grew up that was connected with that city, though not exclusively with its cathedral. In terms of composition, the story slightly antedated the time of Hincmar, who was Archbishop of Reims from 845 to 882, but he gave it definite and enduring shape. His distinguished predecessor, St. Remedius, who died about 533, had the starring role. As related by Hincmar, Remedius had encountered a major problem when baptising to Christianity the Frankish king Clovis I, reigned 481 to 511, in what he believed wrongly was the year 496. The problem was that the cleric charged with bringing Remedius the consecrated chrism could not reach him thanks to the throng filling the church. Consequently, Remedius had turned his gaze heavenward and prayed for help. Help came. A dove, symbolic of the Holy Ghost, had descended, carrying a small stone ampulla of chrism in its beak, 
that moment being captured in this illumination from the early 14th century. Remigius had duly baptised Clovis with the heaven-sent balm. The legend first made an impact on the coronation rite during the reign of Louis IX, that's Saint Louis, who succeeded to the French throne in 1226, for it features in the Ordo of Reims, written about 1230. That Ordo states that on the day of the king's sacre, the monks of the Abbey of Saint-Rémy, where the sacrosanct ampulla was kept, must process with it under a canopy to the cathedral door and there deliver it to the waiting archbishop and bishops. They were to promise to return it in good faith. By way of preparation for the unction stage of the ceremony, illustrated here from a royal manuscript also of the 14th century, the archbishop was required to add a few drops of the miraculously inexhaustible oil to the chrism, which had already been consecrated. This manner of handling what is known as the saint Ampoule, remained essentially unchanged until the coronation of Louis XVI in 1775. On the screen now is an etching of the saint Ampoule, published in 1793, the year in which it was largely destroyed by revolutionaries. Inevitably, patriotic medieval Englishmen could not allow French rulers to enjoy the foregoing distinction without competition. A prophecy therefore arose to the effect that the Virgin Mary had appeared to Thomas Becket, later St Thomas of Canterbury, while the Archbishop was at prayer in a church at Saint, north central France, where he was living in exile, having fled England because of his dispute with Henry II. She gave Becket a golden eagle enclosing a stone flask filled with oil explaining that the oil was to be used for the anointing of future, albeit unspecified, kings of England. Those rulers, the prophecy ran, would recover particular lands lost by their predecessors. Without resorting to force, the first sovereign to be anointed with the oil would take back Aquitaine and Normandy, construct many churches in the Holy Land, expel pagans from Babylon, and erect numerous churches there too. So long as this man greatest among kings, bore the eagle in his bosom, his kingdom would flourish and he would vanquish his foes. As to the transmission of the object, Becket was instructed by the Virgin Mary to deliver it to a monk of St. Cyprian of Poitiers by the name of William. William would hide the eagle in a church in Poitiers until its discovery by the leaders of the pagans. What was supposed to happen next is obscure. The common version of the prophecy ends with the claim that Becket had indeed handed everything over to William the monk. Sandquist, who has studied the prophecy in some detail, finds a remarkable uniformity across the 18 manuscripts that he examined. But who devised the legend and when? To the first question, we shall never know the answer. Historians do better, though, in tackling the second question. Becket was martyred in 1170. None of his earliest biographers has anything to say on the subject. For Sandquist, reference to the recovery of Aquitaine and Normandy puts the prophecy no earlier than 1204. The oldest manuscript containing the story dates from around the second quarter of the 14th century. There is, however, one piece of evidence to tie the prophecy down more precisely. A letter of 1318 from Pope John XXII replying to confidential inquiries made on behalf of Edward II. Despite the loss of the preceding documentation on the English side, scholars can infer from the response, which rehearses the legend at length, if with variations from the common version, that he had asked whether or not he should be anointed with the oil of St Thomas, and whether or not receiving it would be beneficial. It must be remembered that Edward had undergone the traditional coronation rite in 1308, so what was at issue here was a potential re-anointing. The pontiff was disappointingly non-committal, yet urged that if the king did go ahead, then the act ought to be performed privately and kept secret for the sake of avoiding possible public scandal. Interestingly, nevertheless, John XXII asserted that the proposed unction would not detract from that previously administered on two grounds. One, because that had differed both in form and matter, and two, because, quote, royal anointing does not impress anything upon the soul. Since the whole point of the exercise was probably to obtain papal approval for the prospective re-anointing in order to publicise it widely and thereby shore up monarchical authority, 
for Edward II was engaged in protracted negotiations with some of his alienated magnates, it seems unlikely that the rite was ever repeated. Certainly, researchers have found no trace of a re-anointing. All that Edward's most recent biographer avers is that the holy oil had been brought to the king's attention by an unscrupulous Dominican, Nicholas Wisbeach. For most of the remainder of the 14th century, the prophecy seems to have been forgotten. Thomas Walsingham, the St Albans chronicler, was subsequently to record that the golden eagle, having been discovered in Poitiers, had come into the possession of the Black Prince, the eldest son of Edward III, who had lodged it in the Tower of London within a locked chest. It was to have been used in his own coronation, but he had predeceased his father in 1376. And that meant that when Edward III had died in June 1377, the crown had passed to his grandson, Richard II. Attempts to find the eagle before Richard's coronation in July 1377 proved fruitless. Yet that was scarcely the end of the saga. Richard II, on the screen, uh, despite his many faults, was something of an antiquary. Rummaging in the Tower of London around 1397 to 99, he found a chest so securely locked that initially it could not be opened. The king ordered the multiple locks to be forced. There inside was the golden eagle with the ampulla of sacred oil intact. However, his application to the Archbishop of Canterbury for re-anointing was rebuffed, the primate insisting that the administration of the sacrament by the Metropolitan was unrepeatable. Instead, Richard, for whom the end game of his disastrous reign was rapidly approaching, took to carrying the treasure about with him in the manner prescribed in the prophecy. It was to no avail. Upon his return from Ireland in the late summer of 1399, the eagle and oil were confiscated from him at Chester Castle by Archbishop Arundel, who retained them. On 29th September 1399, Richard II was deposed. Confined to Pontefract in Yorkshire, he died suspiciously in February 1400. As a work of art then, the eagle was real. What Richard had appropriated from the Tower of London may well have been the, quote, eagle of gold with rubies and other precious stones that was undoubtedly purchased for Edward I's coronation in 1274. Attested by two chronicles, St Thomas's oil was first used in the coronation of Richard's nemesis, the Lancastrian usurper Henry the Bolingbroke, on the 13th of October 1399. That is the point at which we move more firmly from the realm of fiction to that of fact. But the facts have to be established carefully. Everything that I've told you so far is important because earlier generations of historians, even as late as Lapsley in the 1930s, believed that the prophecy had been fabricated in 1399 as Lancastrian propaganda to design to buttress Henry IV's tenuous claim to the throne. Of course, the papal letter of 1318 explodes that interpretation. Moreover, there's no sign that the Lancastrians made any effort to stress the special character of Henry IV's unction. While it's true that most of the manuscripts narrating the prophecy originated in the 15th century, it's also true that many 15th century writers, not to mention later ones, ignored the oil of St. Thomas in their accounts of the 1399 coronation. One reason for that myopia could have been the huge influence of Westminster Abbey Manuscript 38, and here's a couple of leaves from it, which became the authoritative text of the medieval coronation service in its final recension. The Liber Regalis is notably silent about the golden eagle given to Becket by the Virgin Mary. Rather, it says that the sacrist must provide two files, one of silver for the oil of the catechumens and the other of gilt for the chrism. A two-item wish list was necessary because traditionally English kings were anointed first on the head with the oil and then in the same place with the chrism. The obvious conclusion to draw is that the Liber Regalis was created before Richard discovered the chest and that nobody thought to revise the master exemplar. On the use of St Thomas's oil in Henry V's coronation in 1413, historians are divided. That the second Lancastrian king had also received the heavenly unction was stated by the bi biographer conventionally cited as the pseudo Elmham. McKenna highlights his testimony, but Sandquist is dismissive 
pointing out that the bi biography dates from about 1446, meaning that the author, whoever he was, was unlikely to have been an eyewitness. Wolfe, by contrast, finds the fact that the biography was not written strictly contemporaneously unproblematic. The underlying difficulty here is that Henry V's coronation is very poorly documented, so only the discovery of fresh material is likely to solve the puzzle. The victor of Agincourt died tragically young in France in August 1422, leaving his nine-month-old son heir to the English crown. In reaching the reign of Henry VI, though, we are on solid ground. The protectorate instituted in 1423 was terminated on 6th of November 1429 when the boy, barely eight, went through the gruelling experience of a Westminster Abbey coronation. What an experience that must have been for an eight-year-old. That same day, and this is significant being non-chronicle evidence, the Royal Council issued a warrant to the Exchequer to deliver the Golden Eagle and Ampulla to the Keeper of the Royal Jewels. So clearly, the heavenly oil was deployed on this occasion. And crucially, we know that the ancient custom of anointing with two relatively ordinary oils, the oil of the catechumens and chrism, was now discarded. Henry VI was anointed solely with the Becket oil. Convincing proof that the eagle and its contents were becoming fully integrated within the coronation rite comes from halfway through the reign. Impressed by the ceremonies that he had observed in visiting Henry VI's court, a Portuguese nobleman repeatedly requested some formal description for presentation to his own sovereign in Portugal. The result was that not long before 1449, William Say, Dean of the Chapel Royal, oversaw the production of, and contributed to, a splendid manuscript which not only affords a unique insight into the workings of the medieval chapel royal, but also fortuitously preserves an updated version of the Liber Regalis. Where the Liber Regalis specifies the need to procure the usual two files, there is a mark in the text referring the reader to an annotation entered at the foot of the folio. The annotation which is contemporaneous with the volume, explains that the old practice has been superseded by the use of St. Thomas's miraculous oil taken from the eagle. All that was brought to light by the great medievalist Walter Ullmann, who stumbled upon Say's manuscript at Evora in Portugal and published it in 1961. Since there presumably once existed additional codices of the Liber Regalis, noticing or incorporating that amendment, Scholars are perhaps entitled to suppose that the Becket oil was used again in 1461 for the anointing of Henry VI's supplanter, Edward IV, the first Yorkist king. Concrete information, though, is lacking, alas. Notoriously, Edward IV's heir, Edward V, one of the unfortunate princes in the tower, was never crowned. The next coronation in 1483 was that of the usurper and probable murderer of his nephews, Richard III, whose skeleton, you will recall, was discovered just over a decade ago under a car park in Leicester. By a quirk of fate, we know a great deal about the inauguration of arguably the least appealing of England's many medieval rulers. Dated the day after his coronation, one of the documents, still happily at Westminster Abbey, is an indenture under which the king returned to the safekeeping of the abbot and convent the Golden Eagle, described as being garnished with pearls and precious stones, in which is closed the precious relic called the ampoule. Richard III's death at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485 ushered in the Tudors, <clears throat> who brought an end to the Wars of the Roses, when Henry VII, the victor, married Elizabeth of York in 1486. She was crowned in 1487. Their second son to survive infancy became Henry VIII in 1509. Whether or not St. Thomas's oil featured in any of those three coronations is a mystery. But if the association with Becket was remembered in the 1530s, then that spelt doom for usage after the Henrician Reformation. In that, Henry VIII, while attacking the veneration of the saints in general, conceived a particular hatred of St. Thomas of Canterbury, whose famous shrine in the cathedral there was completely demolished at his behest in 1538. Yet the golden eagle housed in the treasury at Westminster lived on 
Listed in 1606, it appears for the last time in the 1649 inventory of the regalia to be destroyed by order of Parliament. On Saturday, the Archbishop of Canterbury will pour the oil, which has been specially made in Jerusalem, albeit in accordance with the venerable recipe, from a vessel illustrated on the screen now that is a post-restoration artefact somehow modelled on the lost original. At least it will be poured into the exceptionally beautiful coronation spoon, which you see now, the only item of the medieval crown jewels to have escaped the Commonwealth vandals. We've come a long way from the two things, 14th century Anglo-French monarchical rivalry and the desire of the beleaguered Plantagenet kings to draw upon the combined sanctity of the Virgin Mary and Thomas of Canterbury that generated such a colourful native mythology. Nevertheless, now you know why the object today, by a peculiar process of transference, is designated the ampulla, though historically the ampulla was really a distinct item to be found inside its predecessors, but it's fashioned as this rather noble golden eagle. Thank you. George. Thank you, David. Um, and thank you, Professor Woodhead, for the opportunity to give these lectures, and thank you to you all for being here. On the 6th of May, we have the evolution of a thousand-year service that's undergone substantial revision, change, and adaptation. Yet at the heart of the service, from a sacred perspective, is the anointing, the Holy of Holies, which has remained more or less untouched, even with changes of dynasty and the Reformation. It seems clear that this part of the service will remain broadly similar to 1953. There will also be the addition of the anointing and crowning for the Queen Consort too. The last time was in 1937. Yet what of the Lord's anointed in the 21st century? What of significance today? What of the Christian symbolism in the anointing rite? The anointing, indeed the whole service, seems to have had a profound impact on the life of our late queen. To what extent she felt semi-deified or priest-like will be hard to assess in her, until her diaries, if there are accounts, are made public. Turning, however, to two relatively recent examples that reference anointing. Mark Easton, the BBC home editor, wrote poignantly on the moment of anointing in a piece in 2013 when reflecting on the 60th anniversary of 1953. In that instant, the viewing public were meant to believe that their queen was transformed. As a newsreel commentator put it, the hallowing, a moment so old history can barely go deep enough to contain it. When the golden power was removed and the cameras rolled on to the monarch once more, hey presto and hallelujah, Elizabeth had become associated with the divine. The anointing and of course the coronation oath as discussed yesterday seems to have added to her sense of remarkable duty for her entire life. Other commentators spoke of her decision to carry on when there was some talk of abdic abdicating, even when in less good health in 2021. The one main reason why the queen will absolutely not abdic abdicate is unlike other European monarchs, she is an anointed queen. The royal historian Hugo Vickers told the Guardian, referring to the pact she made with God during her coronation, and if you are an anointed queen, you do not abdicate. This may have more to do with Edward VIII and the abdication crisis, and the coronation oath, as discussed yesterday, than the anointing. But it's interesting that 21st century references point to this specific moment or action. It also seems that as per 1953, it's all but certain that the anointing will not be televised in just a few days' time. The filming of King George VI's coronation was a milestone in television broadcasting history for the BBC in particular, as it saw the progress between the complete prohibition placed on the corporation for his wedding as Duke of York in 1923, to the pomp and pageantry and display of coronation rites bar anointing of Queen Elizabeth II in 1953. In 53, a combination of Churchill, who was against televising the whole service, the Queen, and the Archbishop Geoffrey Frischer decided that the anointing ceremony was too sacred a moment to be broadcast. And for this moment, the cameras were paused. As with a wedding, 
many couples choose to have certain moments without iPhones and cameras. This will, of course, be the first coronation in a smartphone world. So the anointing looks set to remain hidden, bar a last minute change of plan, to continue Walter Badgett's idea that we must not let in the daylight upon the magic. It does not look set to follow the accession council televised for the first time. Therefore, we have those in charge of the ceremony in 2023 still seeing the anointing as a sacred moment or too holy or special to be televised. This lecture looks back at British coronation history to focus on anointing and to what extent a monarch was seen to be imbued with a sacerdotal or quasi-sacerdotal status and how this sense of divine right was realized within the ritual of the service. The belief or custom of elevating one being above the people was not original to Britain, as David's already alluded to. However, the expression of these ideas, the praxis of divine right, was enhanced and reinforced in a coronation service. We'll also ask questions of how Charles III can recognize, reconcile his interest in defender of faiths within this ceremony, what changes and additions are linked to ritual with a religious focus, and what of reference to the, to the divine today in what is often seen as an age of secularism. So what exactly is the anointing? David has spoken about the myths, the legend behind the oil, and corrected some of those myths. The act of anointing or consecration with those biblical origins is the most holy or magical part of a British coronation. It involves the monarch disrobing from their crimson robes and any jewelry being worn and being seated on St. Edward's chair, the coronation chair, and then being clothed in a simple white tunic or vestment, not too dissimilar from a baptism. For Elizabeth II's anointing, a canopy of cloth of gold was held over and around the monarch to shield the act from view. This canopy was supported by four knights of the garter. At this point, the Archbishop of Canterbury is handed an ampulla, as David has referenced, in the shape of an eagle containing a special oil or chrism. The ampulla dates back to 1661. The Archbishop is then presented with the coronation spoon, as we've just seen in the previous slide. The Archbishop then pours the chrism into the spoon and anoints the monarch on their head, hands, breast, and chest with the accompanying words, much unchanged since the 17th century, be this thy head anointed with holy oil, as kings and prophets were anointed, and as Solomon was anointed king by Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet, so be you anointed, blessed and consecrated king or queen over the peoples whom the Lord thy God had given thee to rule and govern. The anointing is therefore about changing the king or queen's character by consecration. In other words, the monarch has been made special or imbued with sacredness by the act of anointing, almost akin to the ordination of a priest or a bishop. In the early modern era of Tudors and Stuarts, an age of the divine right of kings, it was argued that the act of anointing conferred upon the ruler divine sanction for his or her kingship. What of the oil? David has already talked about those medieval myths. We're going to come to the shrine of St. Edward in a moment. Perhaps the most unusual entry in the exchequer accounts held at Kew is that of the apothecaries in Ordinary, James Chase and Daniel Malthus, who for £206 provided the anointing oil in 1714. It was a very large composition of rich, essential, chemical, odoriferous oils, balsams and spirits, highly perfumed for the coronation of George I. In a 2018 documentary featuring the late queen, reflecting on her coronation, it was revealed that the recipe for the oil included a secret mixture of sesame and olive oil, orange flowers, roses, jasmine, and cinnamon. The very Reverend Dr. John Hall, the then Dean of Westminster, said that the bottle containing the 53 sample was kept very safe and hidden in a little box in the deanery. The Pharmaceutical Journal, 30th May 1953, revealed that the new secret formula would be similar to that of Charles I in 1625, and had been prepared from a formula used by Peter Squire, which had been made for the coronation of Edward VII in 1902 and King George V in 1911. For 1937, a new supply was made from the old, and a remaining phial had been kept in the deanery. Some of this had somehow survived the Second World War and ended up in a pharmacy in Marylebone, which holds two bottles to this day. Yet, we now know that the anointing for 2023 represents a break with tradition. Before we get to the shrine, we're just going to come to this slide. The oil or chrism 
has never before been originated from Jerusalem in a Westminster Abbey coronation service. This is classic British invention of tradition. Jerusalem sounds traditional, but it's not for the anointing oil used at Westminster Abbey. The oil has been created from the olive groves of the Mount of Olives and has been perfumed with similar oils to that of 53, including amongst others, sesame, rose, jasmine, cinnamon, amber, and orange blossom. It also happens to be animal friendly, free of any kind of animal products. It is a vegan oil. This apparently is to fit with the monarch's expressed desire of sustainability. And it is also a pointer religiously to all the Abrahamic religions, Jerusalem being of immense importance to Christian Jews and Muslims alike. This Mount of Olives reference goes further. It's a pointer to the king's late father, the Duke of Edinburgh, whose mother, Princess Alice, is buried there. And it's also pointed to her aunt, Grand Duchess Elizabeth. The latter was murdered by the Bolsheviks, and her remains were eventually transferred to Jerusalem via Beijing, and she was later made an Orthodox saint. So this is both a familial reference, but it's also a link to Orthodox Christianity. Just as with St. Edward the Confessor and his shrine in Westminster Abbey, so a 21st century monarch is drawing a connection to another family saint. Arguably even more interesting than the objects of the ampulla and the spoon and the oil is the personal transformation believed to have been wrought by the anointing. When Richard II in 1399 was told that he had abdicated all kingly dignity, he replied that he did not wish to renounce those special dignities of a spiritual nature which had been bestowed upon him, nor indeed his anointment. He was in fact unable to renounce them, nor could he cease to retain them. Richard was alluding to the idea that the anointing was analogous to the sacrament of holy orders and hence left an indelible mark of spiritual authority. In short, this consecration conferred a quasi-sacerdotal status. The king was no longer a layman, but he was not quite a priest either. He could not say the mass. That Christian rulers are God's representatives upon earth was a venerable commonplace, but the notion that the anointing was critical as a conduit for heavenly power survived the English Reformation only to become bound up in the 1590s onwards with the developing doctrine of the divine right of kings. One manifestation of the ruler's imputed power was the practice of touching for the king's evil, i.e. the ability of the monarch to cure scrofula, a disease of the lymphatic glands. Not all monarchs spoke enthusiastically about touching for the king's evil or indeed about the holy oil. Elizabeth I was anointed in 1559 as per the traditional Liber Regalis, as David mentioned, though rather disparagingly, she referred to the chrism as grease that smelt ill. For all of their many differences, from the Anglo-Saxons to the Normans, and as dynasties as far apart as the Plantagenets, Tudors, Stuarts, Orange, Hanoverian, and House of Windsor, they've all alike found legitimization afforded by a traditional coronation to be indispensable, and that the heart of that service was the concept of Zadok anointing Solomon. For our forebears in the early modern world, Divine right ideology was an important theory discussed in abstract terms, but the praxis of it came in a coronation, in the anointing with oil and the use of St. Edward the Confessor's chair, incorporating the stone of Schoon, costumes, the wider regalia, and music, and so on. It's been assumed that as England and Britain moved to a more constitutional monarchy, particularly following the Glorious Revolution, divine right would become incompatible with power sharing and therefore would disappear from a coronation. Such an argument is a non sequitur because divine right ideology found in a coronation has nothing to do with the existing constitutional elements present since the earliest times in the form of an acclamation and recognition and an oath, as discussed in the lecture yesterday. The Reformation and religious changes of the Tudor and Stuart periods added further weight to sacral kingship, with the monarch placed at the head of the church as God's vicegerent. Providentialism became a key concept in which God was an acting force in the world in every detail, from the succession of monarchs to the creation and gradual expansion of a British empire. The idea of putting a crown or a reef or other such object on the chief person of importance in the country is very much not bespoke to Britain, but rather something found all over the world, across cultures and continents. One of the most celebrated rulers associated with the divine and absolute power was Francis Louis XIV, the Sun King, 
So too, the association of monarchs with divinity originates in the ancient world, from the pharaohs of Egypt to the Sang dynasty of China, from the Obers of Benin to the Shanamar of Persia, from the emperors of Japan to the Dalai Lama in Tibet. In classical tradition, one need look no further than the Roman Empire with Caesar and the investment of Julius Caesar with a godlike status. Such were the symbolic powers of the double-headed eagle, note the ampulla, and laurel, that these images perpetuated themselves in Byzantine tradition and later in Muscovy. The list goes on and is diverse. These examples of rule by godly approval, rule as a god or goddess, and rule with divine sacerdotal power were age-old concepts long before the birth of Christianity. It's therefore not surprising that the Bible continued such themes, but wove the thread in a monotheistic direction, something that in some ways had already been fostered in Egypt by Akhenaten. French rulers, as David has mentioned, traditionally crowned at Reims and invested with conventional emblems of sovereignty were notable too for their healing powers, their supposed ability to cure scrofula. This efficacy was also found in the British monarchy. Even closer to home, the Stone of Scone would become an intrinsic coronation element incorporated into St. Edward's chair. The swords of the regalia carried at a coronation signified all-powerful sovereignty, coupled with justice and mercy. Along with the katana, the sword of mercy, they were associated with the almost magical nature of Arthurian legend, with Lancelot and Escalibur. Think Disney and the sword of the stone. Think Celtic tales of Tristan and Isolde. Thus, the crowning, anointing, and inaugurating of monarchs by religious figures in holy buildings, using sacred symbols and imbuing them with majesty, has existed for thousands of years across differing cultures. If we therefore hold that divine right ideology is a central feature of coronations, the question is, what does that make a sovereign status? What is at issue here is the extent to which a monarch becomes quasi-sacerdotal in character. Henry III had asked, what does a coronation make me? To be answered, no more than a deacon. Yet that's clearly more than a mere layman. There's therefore a very important distinction between the contractual nature of a coronation as discussed yesterday and divine right rule, limited by no one but God. In the coronation, the anointing and crowning are not simply about the right of the monarch, they're about changing the king's character in the light of that right. The earthly consummation of divine right ideology appears in the anointing and crowning. From that point onwards, as Shakespeare wrote, not all the water in the rough rude sea can wash the balm off from an anointed king. Yet as which Charles I has mentioned, and James II, temporal legalistic authority could be restricted or removed, but only death could end the divine right quality of the perfected sovereign. Ullman's work has already been mentioned, and he sees Henry VIII not as a lay bishop in spiritual terms, but merely a quasi-clerical figure in governmental terms, bound by his coronation oath. However, whilst it's vital to recognise that the monarch was not on a level with members of the ecclesia in the power to make manifest the host, nevertheless a coronation elevated a sovereign spiritually above the laity. The anointing by which divine grace was mediated to sovereigns added further legitimacy to their powers to touch for the king's evil, as mentioned and cemented their positions generally. The foundations of this divine right ideology comes from St. Edward's, the Confessor's Shrine in Westminster Abbey. This is why the coronation takes place there. The coronation feeds off the shrine being there. Every element is connected to it. Even in Elizabeth I's time, the records refer continually to St. Edward, the, first star, St. Edward the Confessor's staff and an offering to St. Edward's shrine. These were the relics of royal holiness, the tangible evidence for contemporaries of the quasi sacerdotal power inherent in sovereignty. So this vicinity mattered, space mattered. Beyond James I's speeches and literary expositions, the theory found expressions in art, in the apotheosis of the king, and would go as far as the 18th century with an apotheosis of Queen Anne in the Queen's drawing room at Hampton Court. The depiction of James I of England was therefore not original nor was the confessionalization of divine right something new. However, the ideas flourished under Charles I. And he strengthened this with his Arminian ideas of the beauty of holiness. Court sermons dwelt on the sacredness of kingship. Yet we know the fate of Charles I. How did this continue? Well, the Bible is brought into hand to continue this theory of divine right, and it becomes a more providentialist move, cementing the Protestant succession. Divine right theory has biblical origins and in much of its justification comes from that. Numerous scriptural texts exemplify sacral kingship. By me kings reign and princes decree justice, Proverbs 
I have said ye are gods, Psalm 82, 6. Such phrases and ideas were used throughout coronation proceedings to affirm the monarch's quasi-sacerdotalism. We see this, for instance, in the processional tributes lining London's streets. Scripture is brought to bear. Henry VIII had liked nothing better than to identify himself as David the Destroyer, or Goliath or Solomon, the builder of the temple. Later in his reign, even seeing himself as Tippus Christi, or David as the type of Christ. These associations continued. Edward VI was often referred to as a Solomon or the young Josiah. Elizabeth I as a gracious Deborah, by whom God causing his Church of England to prosper in health, wealth, peace, policy, learning, religion, and many good gifts and graces. Her portrayal as Deborah by such figures as John Aylmer and John Hales was twofold. On the one, loyal subjects sought to praise their ruler by recognizing their elevated status and answering opponents such as John Knox in his 1558 critique of queenship, and in the other, they wished to provide a model for princely rule. There was perhaps plenty of aspiration here. Deborah of the Book of Judges defeated Israel's enemies and once at once wife, judge, prophetess and mother. She brought 40 years of peace to her people, something almost unheard of for an early modern subject. Thus emphasis on quasi-sacerdotal kingship and a cult of royalty embellished the crown with a repertoire of biblical and classical personae. The Elizabethan cult of Gloriana entailed a profusion of images from the Virgin Mary, a second Eve to Cynthia and Diana. It's also worth noting that this script, scriptural allegory cut both ways. For example, one writer's musings in January 1710, 11, shows how, with hindsight, James II's end could be foretold from his crowning. The biblical allusions are clear, with the torn flag being seen as the curtain of the <coughs> temple being torn in two, Mark 1538, following Christ's crucifixion. The comparison with the holy nature of the sovereign is obvious, together with the providential conclusion that such omens are the work of a higher being. Biblical comparisons invariably featured in coronation services, often in musical form or in a sermon. And a sermon will return in just a few days' time, having not featured since 1911. Make of that what you will. Indeed, they would be prominent in the anthem to surpass all divine right anthems. Handel Zadok the Priest, 1727, played at every coronation since George II's, and to feature again on Saturday. Those familiar with this music will know the extent to which Old Testament figures play a part. Less well known, however, is that this was a new version of an old anthem. An earlier setting had been used for 1603, and it was in Charles I's coronation, as well in 1625-6. The elevation of the sovereign status was not firstly um, was not conceived firstly by the elite, it, it also appeared in the populace. Um, as late as 1727, Handel's anthem struck just the appropriate divine right note for the occasion. In the words of one contemporary, the coronation was the finest and most magnificent of any that was in England. So how else does this live on? What other things are surprising? Royal saints and their afterlives is perhaps another interesting feature. How does that fit with the Reformation. The cult of Edward the Confessor was firmly established with his canonization in 1161, contributing to the belief in the king's evil and the mystical attributes of sovereignty itself. The chief symbols of that majesty were two magnificent crowns, that of St. Edward and that of the imperial crown. And the two modern day versions can be found here. The imperial this is pre-1661, was styled after Henry V turned the Oakland circlet into a closed diadem. Henry VI, Edward IV, and Richard III successively advanced that symbolism of the crown imperial, and Henry VII so magnified that symbolism that he can be said to have invented something new, a veritable cult of sacred imperial kingship. Henry VIII was the epitome of grandeur. His coronation banquet was a sign of things to come, greater than any Caesar had known. For his finale, he even planned a tomb of monumental proportions, but the project was so elaborate that it was far from complete by his death. His kingship had carried an imperial dimension, legally expressed in 1533 to four, which drew inspiration from his ancestors, particularly St. Edward. Crucially, all Henry's successors at their coronations were typically first crowned with St. Edward's crown, aside from Queen Victoria, who was seen as too young and had a too delicate head to take such a vast crown, and Edward VII, who narrowly avoided dying before his coronation from appendicitis. 
Thus, those inheriting the English throne could claim divine or saintly blood in their lineage. St. Edward was to the crown what St. George was as patron saint to the nation and to the Order of the Garter, famously established by Edward III. No doubt there was some fluidity, but the continual coronation invocation of these figures was intrinsically linked with divine right ideology and with a growing providentialism, the notion that England, with its growing empire, was the new Israel. Even under Edward VI, the link for all of the Reformation to the confessor saint lived on. And somehow, the Garter and, George, and St. George, much despised by Edward VI, survived. Although it's difficult to prove, what is likely to have triggered thoughts about St. Edward the Confessor and St. George, especially to those within the Abbey, would be the objects of those that record those names. And it is not, I think, surprising that St. George's Day is picked for three coronations, Charles II, James II, and Queen Anne. Of course, a feast day in itself is intangible, but the objects were not, and they therefore merit more discussion. William the Conqueror had, of course, been crowned on Christmas Day, 1066. In a modern setting, St. George's Chapel, Windsor, is the final resting place of many of our modern monarchs. Having survived the evangelical purge of saints, the confessor's saintly status was excessively and extensively displayed by Tudor queens, Mary Tudor, Elizabeth I. Elizabeth still made that customary offering to the shrine of Edward the Confessor. Something continued in the shape of two formal oblations, as seen in the coronation of James II, and perhaps more surprisingly, William and Mary. Interestingly, St. Edward the Confessor and St. George were nearly joined by a third saint with monarchical connections, in that Henry VII pursued an impressive campaign to have Henry VI canonized. In doing so, the king was acknowledging the strength of the unofficial cult that had emerged, but his efforts ultimately proved abortive. It's clear, therefore, that special saints were harnessed to affirm quasi-sacerdotal kingship for British rulers. It was a case of renewing long-standing customs. In both instances, saintly power was brought to bear even after the Reformation in order to bless the crown and strengthen monarchical ambitions. So what of objects? We have the crowns. Here, I think, is very interesting, this image of the queen being crowned, the late queen. And you'll note that it's as if she is being made like a sacrament. The crown is elevated like elevating the host. This was deliberate. There are other objects worth considering. To, sorry. So the monarch is invested with various items of the regalia. But there's another object called St. Edward's staff that has perhaps as equally an important legendary status in coronation regalia or in coronations as the oil. Although, although sometimes thought to have contained fragments of the true cross, the standard theory behind the original staff was it dated back to the 11th century and that the confessor, indeed, it's possible that it was even depicted in the Bayer Tapestry where a scene shows St. Edward carrying a long staff. Holmes and Sitwell suggest that it remained at Westminster Abbey in the fashion of a walking stick of Celtic saints and presumed to have set the form of an Episcopal crozier. The staff is significant in terms of sacral monarchy, precisely because it holds no actual role in the service. It was carried in the coronation procession functioning as a holy relic. This tradition, as with the cult of St. Edward, was not something that one would expect to have survived England's Reformation. Nevertheless, it continued. In a remarkable account, Pepys reveals how important these associations with St. Edward had been for James II. He told Arthur Charlotte in 1693 that I have seen a chair of about 600-year-olds taken out of Edward the Confessor's monument at Westminster by workmen at the cleaning of it for King James, my unhappy master's coronation, who was pleased to show it to me afterwards with the veneration given to relics. Thus, even at the interregnum, when a new canvas was possible in designing the regalia, Charles II chose to have a replacement staff made. In she, indeed, Charles made it known that he sought a full-blooded medieval coronation that would involve following ancient precedent to express the glamour and glory of the English monarchy. <coughs> the influence of St. Edward is also evident in the so-called coronation chair and its association with the Stone of Schoon, also known as the Stone of Destiny. And this has, of course, political ramifications with Scotland. <coughs> 
and it is shrouded in myth too. It's long believed that it had biblical origins connected with the story of Jacob. It was said to, at some point, to have come from Ireland and then picked up the name Stone of Destiny. It was thought to play a fundamental role in verifying kingship by attesting a true claim but remaining mute or false if it was not the real candidate. Quite how a, a stone speaks um, is a mystery to me. Um, after its Irish stint, folklore has it that the stone finished up at the Moot Hill at Schoon, where it was used for coronations of Scottish kings until the 13th century. Having been captured by Edward I, it was conveyed to Westminster Abbey, where the coronation chair was built to accommodate it. And remarkably, in the 21st century, when it arrived last Saturday at Westminster Abbey, there was a service of investing of the stone. The coronation chair possesses its own folklore. The figure of a king, either Edward the Confessor or Edward I, was painted on the back, leading to the belief, the invention of tradition again, that this was St. Edward the Confessor's chair. Sanford indicates why it gained that associ association. So he's writing 1687, that it had been solemnly offered by King Edward I to Edward the Confessor, the morrow after the festival of St. Boltoff, anno 1297, from whence it hath the name St. Edward's chair. The problem with the coronation chair is it's no longer as impressive as it once was, therefore requires an imaginative effort to picture it in an early modern setting. One could be deceived into thinking that it was entirely visible on a coronation day, but as David has also uncovered, evidence suggests that under both Tudors and Stuarts, it was covered by a substantial quantity of cloth of gold. The point, therefore, is that while now its appearance does not suggest perhaps the majesty of divine right, with those such trappings, it must surely have done so. Having reviewed the history of the chair as an object, we turn to its role in the service. The coronation chair must be distinguished from the throne placed at the center of the theater, the intersection of nave and transept, which was used before and after the investiture with the regalia. In 1661, St. Edward's chair was first located on the north side of the high altar, and at the appropriate moment moved to set right over against the altar. It's clear from illustrations, from the likes of Ogilby and Sanford, especially the latter, because he includes a particular plan, that this was meant to be a position in the Sacrarium directly over the Cosmati pavement, and only about 20 feet from the altar, much closer than in modern coronations. The significance of this proximity is worth pondering. As a form of relic, the chair not only emitted a form of spiritual radioactivity, but also drew power as much from its colorful past with the stone as from its presence in this sacred space. And here we have space again. Its location directly facing the altar harks back to the pre-Reformation mass in terms of the witnessing of the elevation of the host. Arguably, this setting elevated the state of both chair and altar. The chair, by being so close to the altar, was enhanced with association of the grace-giving Eucharistic powers, whilst the altar gave spiritually by being so close to the chair. A reciprocal relationship existed. This reciprocity continued in the coronation itself. For adherence to divine right ideology, the sovereign acquired spiritual status from being crowned in this chair. Yet the chair was also imbued with added spiritual value by having the monarch crowned in it. Despite the anachronism or of the reverent connection to the confessor, it still persisted to this day. And in the liturgy, it's going to be referred to as St. Edward's chair. The action at the east end of the sacrarium in the vicinity of the coronation chair continued in acts of homage. These were paid to the high altar and in St. Edward's Chapel, the latter located behind the altar. The Tudors prostrated themselves at the confessor's shrine, where it was conventional to offer bread and wine. Surprisingly, for his Calvinistic background, William III did the same. Such allusions to the Holy Spirit, as well with the scepter and rod, ivory rod with the dove, which is there, continue long after the Reformation. On the second point, George I was to also offer his sword to the altar, and he too proceeded to St. Edward's Chapel. Hence, sovereigns of different dynasties have all inherited and embraced this spiritual mantle. Now, obviously, the appreciation of these objects of crown, staff, chair, scepters, and so on, and these sacred spaces almost certainly varied from person to person, and will probably also have changed over time, but such perceptions are impossible to document systematically. Nevertheless, the key point is that these objects and places were invariably described in the terms discussed above and that I've mentioned already, and, and these resonances can't be ignored. This is all the more interesting when in 2023, 
we have a new addition, a Welsh cross from our current king to the coronation relics, apparently including shards of the true cross and a gift from Pope Francis. Contradictory opinion existed as to what a sovereign was from a coronation. One act of parliament spoke of power being given by God to princes of earth, your grace being a layman. By contrast, Henry VIII regarded himself as akin to a bishop, a lay bishop such as the Emperor Constantine had been. He was a sovereign who was fide defensor, defender of the faith. The title remained even after his renunciation of Roman obedience. His status as God's vicegerent and combining temporal and spiritual powers was represented iconographically in the famous title page to the Great Bible of 1539. That the authority that came with this association with St. Edward the Confessor and the anointing was increasingly important is suggested by the fact that Henry VIII required Anne Boleyn to be crowned with St. Edward's crown. This was unprecedented for a queen consort. The pattern of sovereigns as conduits for God's word was pe perpetuated under Edward VI. The frontispiece of Cranmer's 1550 catechism shows the boy king handling the, bu handing the Bible to the bishops. These notions, once established, would continue far beyond the Tudor dynasty, in processions, in poems, in writings. Regarding James II's crowning, one correspondent told the Archbishop William Sancroft that the time of His Majesty's coronation is at hand, wherein his blood is consecrated by your grace or some other bishop. The coronation is clearly here viewed as making the monarch sacred. To consecrate is to set apart a personal thing a sacred to God. It's to dedicate solemnly for some sacred or religious purpose, and so to give the object itself a character of holiness. The mass, for example, is made holy when the elements are consecrated and the host is elevated, making it fit for religious use. A coronation can be seen in that light. It is, in many respects, a sacrament akin to a Eucharist. In this instance, the sovereign is consecrated like a priest who, undergoing ordination, is anointed. This is key in British coronations. By contrast, Italian princes, except the Pope, remained unanointed and did not have the status of persona sacrae or anointed sacred beings. The monarch in the British coronation service is anointed, as David has mentioned, although we've established this myth, with holy chrism, anal analogously to Christ, for the Messiah was anointed king, priest, and prophet. Likewise, the adoration of the Magi, who came to pay homage to the infant Jesus, are replicated in a coronation. Just as Jesus had a ministry, so the coronation invests the ruler with a pastoral charge. The investiture with religious vestments and symbols accentuates this dual role, paralleling the way in which a priest's clothing signifies his position. And there will be special vestments on the day for the monarch. And it is similar, as we talked about yesterday, to some kind of marriage contract. Pulling these threads together, we can see that the sacramental theme is particularly prominent in coronations. Firstly, reminiscent of the mass, the coronation chair faced the high altar. Secondly, the monarch was anointed by the efficient. By the efficient. Thirdly, and crucially, the prelate elevates the crown, as we've seen in the image for Elizabeth II, even in 1953, and places it on the anointed monarch's head. And fourthly, the sovereign receives a coronation ring to affirm their marriage to the realm. In broad terms, as I conclude, the coronation has retained features that include the concept of a sacred or semi-deified monarch. Even to this day, the anointing of the sovereign is seen as too holy by those organizing the service to be televised. Coronations ostensibly endowed sovereigns with this quasi-sacerdotal power. They were devised to elevate the monarch. Some thought it gave them the power to touch for the king's evil though this was, as Aylmer's work has uncovered, perhaps not just exclusive to the crown. The coronation, fused with this divine right ideology, continued to be steeped in a religiosity epitomized by consecration and providentialism. Items of the regalia were deployed and will be deployed again on Saturday to symbolize the attributes of divine rule. These objects, effectively relics, were at times real to men's minds with their accretion of history and legend, of Tristram, of King Arthur, of the Fellowship of the Round Table, and of Charlemagne. And as already mentioned, we have a new edition in the Welsh Cross in 2023. Our forebears embraced the idea of sacral kingship with dedications, with poems, with literature, as well as at times the public demand for touching for the king's evil. 
just as the sovereign was drawn in parallel to biblical and classical figures, so Britain had become Israel and Westminster Jerusalem. But how does any of this fit today? How do any of these ideas work in the 21st century? What does this mean for Charles III? How does Charles III reconcile the anointing and his special position within the state church with those of other Christian denominations and other faiths within the service? In the music, we now know that there's going to be a further reference to his late father, the Duke of Edinburgh, with Greek Orthodox music to feature, to be performed by the Byzantine chant ensemble. Thus, in both music and the choice of anointing oil, we have reference to the Orthodox faith, not something that's featured before in a Westminster Abbey coronation service. Although the super tunica, one of the vestments worn after the anointing for the investiture, is inspired by vestments of the early church and Byzantine empire, there's no other link in the service. The panoply of musical choices also reflects different Christian denominations, with the gospel choir, the ascension choir participating to the wide range of other traditional choices. Members of the peerage from other faiths, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, and Jewish peers will present the sovereign with four key items of the regalia during the ceremony. In 1953, it's sometimes forgotten that the moderator of the General Assembly of Scotland presented the Bible to Queen Elizabeth II. So other denominations have played prominent roles before, and so that precedent began in 53. For this coronation, an ecumen ecumenical blessing will also be given. The Archbishop of York, the Greek Orthodox Archbishop, the moderator of the Free Churches, the Secretary General of Churches Together in England, the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, and the Archbishop of Canterbury will give a blessing. We've been accustomed to other faiths and denominations being represented in services of national importance, from Commonwealth Day services to the Cenotaph Remembrance Sunday service, with other Christian denominations such as Methodists or the Chief Rabbi being present. Whilst these are changes from 1953, it is a reflection of the time, something that has perhaps always been part of the service. Many of the celebrities, if you want, of 1953 were key figures from the Second World War. Alan Brooke, Churchill, Montgomery. The peerage made up the guests for coronations until 1689, but from then the House of Commons was invited too. Guest lists change with the times. Ultimately, though, we come back to perceptions. What will people make of the service and the anointing? There's now an opportunity for the public beyond the Abbey to give an oath of allegiance. Is this tempting fate? Will it be as per 1953 and Charles III being associated with the divine? Or will such steps be rejected in 2023? Time will but show, but the service will almost certainly add to the sense of duty and the role of the monarch for the king himself. And of course, the queen consort who will also be anointed. Thank you.